Welcome to the Politics of Everything. I'm Amber Danes, your host and podcast producer. This is a half hour of power, a podcast dropping every week where I unpack the politics of everything, from money to motherhood, nutrition to narcissism, startups to secularism, the environment, equality, and much, much more. Our guests are seasoned in the field or topic of their choice, even if you've not heard of them yet. This is a non-partisan show. So while I love exploring varied views and get a buzz from a healthy debate of ideas, this is not a purely blue, white, green program. Please subscribe, tune in and enjoy the politics of everything. Israel is an entrepreneurial powerhouse and a hotbed for pioneering technologies, profitable business opportunities and high investment returns. For these reasons, it's no surprise that the world's leading multinational companies have chosen Israel. Think of brands like Microsoft, Motorola, Google, Apple, Intel, Siemens, Philips, AOL, you get the picture. They're just some of the names in the long list of over 200 multinational corporations who've realised that Israel is their ideal investment opportunity. Furthermore, many multinational corporations such as Kodak and Citibank and many others have established innovation headquarters in Israel. So how does Israel manage to stay on top of technology in a variety of sectors? And moreover, what makes it so unique that so many international players come and seek their next innovation over there? To find out, I've got an expert on the topic here with me today. It's Yoel Israel, and he's an Israeli-American tech entrepreneur who has been at the forefront of the Israeli marketing ecosystem. He founded a number of companies, including Wadi Digital, Israel's leading technology marketing agency, and Sci Influencer, a cybersecurity influencer and distribution platform, as well as Israel Unfiltered, a social platform that highlights the culture and the people of Israel to the English-speaking world. His extensive background in marketing and technology is matched only by his passion for innovation and entrepreneurship, and he's been able to establish himself as a leader in the industry. He lives in the Haifa district of Israel with his wife and two daughters, and Shalom Yoel, welcome to the Politics of Everything. Thank you, Amber. Yeah, I'm really happy that you have me on today. Podcasting remotely can be challenging, but it doesn't have to be. Since 2017, I have relied on Zencaster's all-in-one web-based solution to make the process quick and painless, the way podcasting should be. If you know me, I'm pretty obsessed with quality guests, quality content, and quality sound, and that's what Zencaster allows me to do. Not to mention, it's really easy to use, even for my guests that aren't particularly tech savvy. There's nothing to download, they just click on the link and we start recording. Zencaster is all about making your podcasting experience easy, and with everything from local recording to automatic post-production, all in the one tool, you don't have to leave your browser to get each episode done. I want you to have the same great experience that I do for all my podcasts and content needs. So I have a special offer for you. If you go to zen.ai forward slash politics of everything and enter this promo code, you'll get 30% off in your first three months when you sign up to Zencaster Pro. That's Z-E-N dot A-I, politics of everything. It's now time to share your story. So tell us about your childhood career ambitions. Did you think you'd end up in tech or did you have some other ideas when you were a kid of what you might want to be when you grew up? Not like many little boys. I grew up in, I grew up in Philadelphia in the United States. I mean, I wanted to be a baseball player. The thought or the understanding of what technology is was trying to get my Nintendo, my Nintendo to work, you know, blowing the cartridges. <laughs> trying to, <laughs> that, was, that was the extent of any kind of introduction to any kind of technology. And I didn't. I didn't even think of it that way. I don't think I know what the word was when I was a boy, but uh, I had a very stereotypical, probably boy upbringing, you know, just mostly sports with my neighbors, video game school, any thoughts of entrepreneurship wasn't really relevant. So did you go on to study at college or how did you actually end up, I guess, getting your start in the sector? Well, I think it really, it happened like, well, I I studied finance, international business at college in Philly. And uh, then I got my MBA actually in Israel. And really it just kind of happened almost organic and naturally. Sometimes like a a culture can just kind of sweep you up. And Israel's tech and marketing culture really swept me up. So I started to just naturally network and connect with people that were succeeding in tech. And I built very deep relationships and discovered that I actually do have an entrepreneurial side of me. And it kind of realized it retroactively, not in my childhood, like you asked, but a little bit in college, I started like some organizations that were like Israel oriented. You know, I took on, you know, around for like being like treasurer of my fraternity, which is a large fraternity on campus. You know, so I do kind of like in hindsight, seeing that I always had leadership 
qualities and I always pursued leadership roles, but I never really saw anything sort of like entrepreneurial, right? Other than trying to like shovel my neighbor's snow kind of thing. <laughs> but that was more to kind of get out and I just wanted money. And I think so many other kids did that, that I wouldn't really consider it anything extra special. But college wise, I mean, no, I mean, you don't learn. I'm not a big advocate of college, even though I have an MBA and I have top grades and all of that. I learned that now you can learn a lot more in the private industry. But I have learned specifically that in order, the way I got into tech, it's just meeting people one-on-one, how real business is done, getting coffee, getting beers with people, right? And just seeing how you can help, try to provide as much value as possible, try to connect as many people as I can. And through that, opportunities arose. So there are around 6,000 startups in Israel, and a lot of them do have that tech edge. And I recall that the Israeli government, you know, founded sort of that technology incubator program, you know, 30 odd years ago, and there are over 25 incubators across the country, all of which have been privatized. I saw a report by Deloitte that recently quoted to say that the incubators offer government funding of up to 85% in the early stage across for the cost for two years and they nurture companies from seed to early stage, thus minimizing the risk to the investor. And over 1,000 projects have so far graduated from these incubators with over 45% successfully attracting additional investments from different investors. I'd love to just get your take on how Israel became the self-proclaimed tech startup of the capital world. And it has to be more than just government support that got it there. Right. So there's this like fascination that like anyone that's ever had it to like overcome any challenges you became stronger, right? So whether you work out physically or if let's say you overcame addiction and then you've been, let's say, clean for a few years, you are now stronger and more capable person than someone that's, let's say, never been addicted in the first place. It sounds crazy, but there is truth to it. So Israel Tech actually grew out of the need in order to survive. So always being under cyber attack from terrorist states such as you know uh, Iran, China, sometimes Russia, North Korea, and being physically attacked by, you know, Hamas and Hezbollah and other terrorist organizations, we find that the only way to survive is to innovate and to always be a step ahead. If it wasn't for that, I think Israel would still be the third world basket case it was 30 to 40 years ago. The reason why Israel's actually been able to come out is that the military has focused extremely on technology is the only way that we can kind of stay ahead of those that are trying to kill us. And what's happened is the partnership with the government and in the army and everyone's required to serve in the military, after they leave the military, a lot of them were intelligence and all of that involved in technologies. They're encouraged by the government to start startups. And that's kind of what happened. The government was very, very supportive. And so people went out into the world and uh, into the market and started taking what they learned in cybersecurity, in AI, you know, in processing big data, things that the military was doing on the technological side, and they were finding uh, solutions for it, for using it for enterprises in the private industry. And the government's been very, very supportive um, and been kind of like you mentioned privatization. They try to keep like as hands off as possible because they know that they don't want to kill the golden goose, right? This is the goose give, giving us golden eggs. We don't want to overregulate. It's probably the only part of Israel's economy which is un, which is not strong, overly regulated, which is why it's so successful. Yeah, absolutely. So that does make sense yeah, so when you put it like that. Yeah. Um, America too, by the way, right? So like yes. people overregulated, probably the rest of the world, right? Finance has been regulated, farming, everything's been regulated, regulated, regulated. But as we, as Countries notice that the liberalization of economies, it's hard to deregulate. So when a new industries pop up and they can come in unregulated, that's, uh, that's what I say why like the whole crypto thing is really taking off and catching on is because regulations aren't able to keep up with the changes in the innovation in the market. So as long as we continue to innovate and the government recognizes, the Israeli government recognizes how great it is actually for the economy, for creating jobs, for bringing wealth, and for tax collections, the government's favorite thing, that, <laughs> you know, is that like, why would, we, why would we discourage this? Let's support it as much as we can. And I think it was one of the very few ways that I think the government has actually been supportive of the economy at large. So in 2016 alone, which was quite a few years ago, Israeli startups raised a record of $4.8 billion from investors, while high-tech and startup companies were sold for over $10 billion through acquisitions or IPOs. 
Israel is also home to one of the highest number of engineers per capita and the world's second highest R&D expenditure as per percentage of GDP, around 4.3%. I'm curious to know, fast forwarding to 2022, has the pandemic and I guess factors like not just the wars perhaps um, in the Middle East, but you, with what's happening in the Ukraine and Russia, inflationary pressures in the US and the rest of the world, for example, dampened some of this runaway success, if you like? Well, no, quite the contrary for the tech sector. I mean, like everyone, the lack, like it wasn't the pandemic that made things hard. It was the lockdowns, just to be clear, right? Yeah. And Australia, I know, also had it, especially thing in Melbourne. You guys had some challenges there. But the, really- The, st- the longest people, lockdown in the world, I think it was in Melbourne. It's, <laughs> it, 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 it's ridiculous. It's like, might as well just be communist China. But um, <laughs> let's put that aside for a minute. Uh, I'm here to talk about Israel. The, uh, what happened is, so like in general, like the lockdowns really hurt people, a lot of blue collar, a lot of in-person work that needed to be done. The tech sector, on the other hand, has taken off dramatically. Cybersecurity needs are still needed. When the economy shit and people are struggling more, they might turn more to, let's say, hacking, unethical hacking, and all of that. Therefore, more cyber, AI, more big data. That doesn't go away. Overall, large enterprises are weren't much affected by the pandemic. They're usually technology companies or something in that space, and they also need they also need technological support. So the Israeli companies weren't actually affected. The tech companies weren't affected. They were actually really helped. When it came to the war with Russia and Ukraine, it's very, very different. People don't really understand. Uh, I usually speak to this of Americans, but this might be similar to Australians. That you know, America, Australia, they're big countries and they're very geographically separated from much of the rest of the world. So they kind of don't understand a lot of foreign policy, what goes on. Uh, Australia probably better than America because you're near China. I mean, you need to think about Americans' neighbors are Mexico and Canada, right? They're in probably the easiest place in the world to live. But what we found, you know, Russia is on Israel's border in Syria, and Israel coordinates, has an interesting relationship with Russia. It coordinates when it attacks the Hezbollah terrorists, which are allied with Russia and Iran, that they were going to, we have like certain rules that Israel will engage with, and we speak with the Russians before we go and we bomb uh, terrorists or weapons that are being imported to attack Israeli civilians, such as guided missiles. So we have this interesting relationship with Russia where Israel kind of dances a fine line. But I don't think it, it hasn't affected Israel. And I don't really think it affected much of the world at all. Um, the only thing it affected is maybe housing because a lot of Ukrainians did end up moving to Israel. So the Israel has, I think, like the most expensive housing in the world has gone even a little bit more expensive. But I put that responsibility not on the Russia or Ukraine war. I put it on the Israeli government not deregulating enough in order to drop the price of housing. So one recent article I read says that Israel's tech ecosystem is strong and vibrant, but it has areas of vulnerability that could pose challenges to the industry and possibly to the wider Israeli economy. And this was sort of warned by the outgoing executive director of a tech-focused organisation, which I'm sure you're familiar with, called Startup Nation Central, Wendy Singer. What do you make of this perspective? And do you think that's something that Israel needs to overcome? Or is it just business as usual and it's, it's full steam ahead? No, I think it's business as usual. I think people are always going to say strong and vibrant, but there's areas of vulnerability. You can say that about anything that's strong and vibrant. You know, there's always areas of vulnerability. That's kind of, a, I don't think it's nothing really to worry about. I think you should focus on what those areas of vulnerabilities are. You know, like a SWOT analysis with your strengths, you know, strengths and weaknesses, opportunities and threats. But I'm a big believer in general. I think Israel is going to continue to double down on her strengths. I think you're going to see a lot more space technology because, as I stated earlier, a lot of the technologies that we're seeing is actually not just in Israel. Also, China and the United States actually comes originally from the military and the military needing it. And he, whoever controls space controls Earth. People start to understand this first. I think civilians start to understand this. Got a sneak peek when Elon Musk via Starlink provided Internet access to everyone in Ukraine. Yes. Right. And create internet access. And then people understand that if you control space, you control Earth, right? The satellites, the cameras and everything. It's astonishing the technology that is in space, the GPS, right? We don't even think about that. And that's not necessarily a, a new technology, so to speak. So I think you'll be seeing a lot. You, you, I think you should see more of the opportunities and where people are seeing like vulnerabilities, you know, and challenges. I think often those are great as long as you notice them yes, because if you can as a state you know if you can overcome your vulnerabilities if you can overcome your challenges if you can properly pivot and stay ahead then that's great that means you're going to continue to innovate and continue to be an industry leader in technology um, and for israel to do that we need vulnerabilities we need challenges 
but you know, both by private sector competition and also from terrorist states that want to eradicate the Jewish people, such as Iran. So that's actually, I find it as long as we're on top of it, it's actually an advantage to push the tech sector forward. I have a very, I have a much more optimistic view and I don't see threats as, I see threats addressed are actually opportunities. Absolutely. And I guess to sort of personalize this a bit, in your own businesses, which you formed and your entities, how have you applied some of that innovation so that, you know, you don't just become stale and, and I guess complacent in what you do, even if you are a leader? Right. Right. Exactly. I mean, like I saw that there was like threats, there were challenges to my clients with influencer marketing. I had three cybersecurity clients in the scope of six months yeah. asked me about influencer marketing. Uh, just so you know, people were a marketing agency serving Israel's tech center, cybersecurity, AI, big data, med tech, and all kinds of other technology companies that are B2B only. And what we discovered is that like there really wasn't anything there. And we actually saw the fact that they were struggling with making progress through influencer marketing, these Israeli cybersecurity startups. So we were therefore able to, like I stated, like adapt, address, and then we actually came up with two different unique solutions for cybersecurity influencer marketing that solves the problem with all of B2B tech influencer marketing. And we'll be expanding into other industries later this year. So it sounds like your innovation is at the core of everything that you, you kind of do because sometimes it's client driven, but sometimes obviously entities can offer solutions which maybe clients haven't thought about before or aren't quite there yet. Like even the mentioning of that, you know, the ideas around the space, technology being the future. And I guess most of us don't think of it like that. We do think of, you know, our everyday lives as just whatever's in the in our phones or on our computers or whatever's in front of us. But I guess to stay ahead is really, I guess, the key to, to innovation and tech. Right. You need to be a few steps ahead. People don't think about the future, right? I mean, this is human nature, right? Especially the younger you are, you know, like how many people smoke cigarettes when they're young and they know it's unhealthy for them, but you don't feel it. Same thing with people in bad eating habits. I mean, we all, we're all guilty of these in different ways, right? We should be going to bed earlier or shutting off our phone earlier or whatever it is, spend more time with our kids. These are all things that maybe we don't want to do or like we know we should do, but there's always something else getting in the way. But so I think if we're able to kind of see ahead, see around the corner, and if you can plan, adapt, and prioritize it, I mean, I think you will succeed. And in, in, no matter where you are in any private industry, uh, it's important. You know, timing is imperative. So you don't want to be too far ahead, right? You don't want to talk about how are we, you know, you don't want any kind of technology that's what's it going to do with, um, I'm trying to think of a crazy example, civilized Mars, right? That's too far yes. ahead. <laughs> it wouldn't be a relevant startup for the next generation. But just maybe someone has some technologies and ideas that might actually be useful, but it's useless. That would be too early. So you want to be just right just ahead just enough you see just around the corner and by the way that's not hard to do right we're seeing a move to battery we're seeing a move um to energy for green energy it's clean it takes up the least space is nuclear fusion nuclear 4.0 this is around the corner how can you help serve them right and then you can see current challenges like windmills kill how many birds we don't talk about that is there where you can <laughs> make windmills don't. safer so they don't kill birds <laughs> yeah right people don't because right it's like it's taboo right but they kill the same amount of birds thousands of birds so a day even so like you know how are we going to how do we fix these things? If you look around, people are talking about the dirty oceans. And now there's startups that are going to clean literally 90% of the trash in the ocean in the next 10 years. So there's a lot of hope and a lot of opportunity. And if you, if you look at the problems today or the problems that are, might accumulate over the next few years and you start to provide those solutions now, I think you'll be very successful. And yeah, I, so I really think people should always try to innovate, try to understand what people wants and needs are, where technology is going. Um, and sometimes that means not necessarily understanding people's needs, right? No one wa- asks for the iPad or the yeah, iPod exactly. or the That's iPhone. That's what I mean. It was a created or need. The mouse, <laughs> right? Or the mouse. Sometimes like, you just need to understand like, hey, this will make things easier, but no one's asking or talking about it. So no one's talking about windmills killing birds. However, if you were able to come up with that solution and you did a good marketing campaign about it and that we have the solution, you know, then I think people will be lining up for your improved windmills. Absolutely. Changing tack a little bit. I am always a believer people throughout their business or their career life have actually had perhaps one or two key people who've been really influential in their life or their careers. Do you have one or two mentors that stand out for you and what kind of impact have they had on your journey? Right. Well, I've had mostly, so, so often meant, thank God for the internet age, but actually it was really books. So Robert Kiyosaki, I mean, he's a mentor, but not in person. I don't know if you want in person or in people I know in person. Doesn't matter. Some people, book. it's a book. Some people, it's like literally watching a TEDx talk and that person's become, you know, a bit of an inspiration right, or right, change their exactly. mindset. You know, it's just that, that person that you remember, maybe one year, two years, five years after you've actually read that book or had that experience. 
Exactly right. So one would be Robert Kiyosaki, who wrote Rich Dad, Poor Dad, yes. who, under, who taught me how money actually works. And that's probably been in cash flow, the difference between an actual asset liability, not the accounting definitions, but the real life definitions. Um, and he's actually really helped me in my business and my personal life in order to able to uh, in order to reach personal milestones that I wanted to and continues to. And then another one would probably be like a lot of other people talk about is, is Elon Musk. I know I already I mentioned him a moment ago. He's actually really been just seeing how he's always trying to innovate, staying ahead. He's pretty authentic in his reasons for doing things. So, you know, as I said, the future was space. He went to space. No one was talking about an example of um, reusable rockets, but it saved so much money that that's what he focused on. No one asked about it. No one thought it was possible. And he saw an opportunity there that no one else saw or asked for. And so how can we get rise and we shoot into space? How can we bring that back down to reuse? Because those are extremely expensive and very long to make. So he's been able to solve that. So seeing how he kind of thinks and freely speaks his mind, I think is something that's uh, had a significant impact on my life for me to be able to kind of just focus on innovation, what people want to really put in, put in the hard work, and also just kind of be a little bit of a free thinker, challenge the status quo, and don't be scared to kind of stick out and have haters. I'm okay with it. Absolutely. So if we spoke again in a year's time, what would be the number one thing you would hope to have changed in your business or career and why? I would. My goal is to get myself, ideally in one year, to probably build a strong marketing team for internally. I would, And I'd like to take on marketing automation, sales, and CEO roles so I can uh, kind of step back from the business a little bit and focus more on business development and networking and focus more on the influencer marketing, not the tech marketing agency side. I mean, also, I'd like to expand into another industry or two. That would probably be my goal. That's a lot of things. And, uh, <laughs> yeah, I have, I have a lot on my plate, and I'm looking to build a social media platform for cybersecurity professionals. How awesome. That's something else uh, that I'm working on now. Great. A final takeaway message for us today on the politics of the Israeli tech sector. It's fascinating. Israel's very unique is that one that people don't know, Israel's like a population of 9 million, right? And it's mad small. It's like, you know, it's the size of Jersey, New, New Jersey, but there's that people really help each other here. So even if they're, you compete, people will still help each other. That's what's fascinating. So like if I have, if let's say I have a, a lead that wants to work with us, but I'm working with their competitor, so I'll send them to a, my competitor of mine. I don't mind. I'd rather things stay in the ecosystem. Being open, being giving, helping people, networking is the trick, is the, is the, is the glue that helped. That is the politics of Israel. If you keep things to yourself, if you don't want to share, right, if you think very hierarchical, then you're going to end up losing. Here, it's very give and help. It's very much, even though we compete, we're all in this together. And it's kind of something that it's kind of has to do with kind of like with the Jewish spirit. And so if you want to get into the Israeli tech sector, if you want to get involved, is that understand literally everybody knows everybody. So don't say anything bad about anybody. <laughs> It'll come back to bite uh, you for number sure. One, it will <laughs> come back to bite you. Only be good and be giving. And the more positive you put out there, it's very, very easy to reach the, reach the tipping point in Israel where the whole country, you know, at least the tech center, which is what we're talking about, will be able to get to know you pretty rapidly because it's so small and so uh, incestual, as some people like to say. <laughs> well, it's been absolutely fascinating chatting with you today. We covered so much. If you do want to reach out to Yael Israel, we will have some details of his contact information on our show notes, as always. Until next time, take care. Thank you so much. Thanks so much for listening today. If you've enjoyed the politics of everything, I thrive on your feedback. So please add a short review and share the podcast with your network through Apple, Spotify, and all the usual suspects. I'm always on the hunt for new and diverse guests. So if you or someone you know has a fresh idea you're busting to get out there, please email me at amber at amberdanes.com and my crew will get back to you very soon.